வணக்கம் இஸ் இட் ரியலி இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் டு அண்டர்ஸ்டாண்ட் த டீட்டெயில்டு அனாட்டமி ஆஃப் த மெட்டகாப்பல்ஸ் அண்ட் ஃபேலஞ்சஸ் வை நாட் ஜஸ்ட் லேர்ன் அபவுட் த ஃப்ராக்சர் மேனேஜ்மெண்ட் அண்ட் கெட் ஆன் லெட் செ இட் லைக் திஸ் த க்ளூ டு கரெக்ட் டயக்னோசிஸ் இன் த ஃப்ராக்சர் ஆஃப் த மெட்டகாப்பல்ஸ் அண்ட் ஃபேலஞ்சஸ் லைஸ் இன் தி அனாட்டமி த க்ளூ டு கரெக்ட் பிளானிங் ஆஃப் த மேனேஜ்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் ஃப்ராக்சர்ஸ் லைஸ் இன் தி அனாட்டமி த க்ளூ to choosing the correct method of management of a fracture of these bones lies in the anatomy the clue to the correct surgical techniques if surgery is indicated lies in the anatomy the clue to post operative protocols lies in the anatomy isn't that enough now that you're convinced we shall learn about the anatomy of the metacarpals and phalanges not just the structural anatomy but also the functional and surgical anatomy with the relevance to fractures of these bones and their management in this video we are going to learn about the anatomy of the metacarpals and phalanges not just the structural anatomy but also the functional anatomy and the surgical anatomy under the structural anatomy we shall be learning about the parts of the bone the articulations both proximally and distally the attachments that is the muscles the tendons and the ligaments the blood supply and the ossification pattern in the functional anatomy we shall learn how the anatomy of the bone influences the function of the finger and the hand and in the surgical anatomy we shall learn how the anatomical factors help us to make a diagnosis to treat fractures and to modify the techniques of management first we shall consider the metacarpal bones they consist of four parts the base the body or shaft the neck and the head the bases of the metacarpals are expanded proximally and contain the articular surface which articulate with the distal row of the carpal bones the third metacarpal base has a styloid process that projects dorsally into an angle between the capitate and the trapezoid as far as the body of the metacarpal is concerned which is also known as the shaft there is a characteristic ridge on the flexor surface and a long flat triangle on the extensor surface with a proximal ridge the shafts of all the metacarpals contribute to the gentle concavity of the palm the neck of the metacarpal is the part which is in the subcapital region inferior to the head so it lies between the shaft and the head the nutrient foramina are often located here the head of the metacarpal is very characteristic it has a rounded articular surface to articulate with the proximal phalanx this rounded articular surface extends further on the flexor side than on the extensor side so it is oriented more to the volar side the adjacent surfaces of the heads are pitted by deep smooth fossae which allow the passage of the interosseous tendons behind these fossae lie tubercles for the attachment of the collateral ligaments for the metacarpophalangeal joint and it is the heads of the four finger metacarpals that form the convexity distally and dorsally to make the knuckles of the fist the metacarpal bones articulate proximally with the carpal bones and distally with the proximal phalanges the proximal articulation with the distal row of carpal bones is as follows The first metacarpal that is the thumb metacarpal articulates with the trapezium via a saddle shaped synovial joint the second metacarpal the index metacarpal articulates with the trapezium as well as the trapezoid via a small tubercle the third metacarpal or the middle metacarpal articulates mainly with the capitate and to a very small part with the trapezoid the fourth metacarpal or the ring metacarpal articulates with the hamate as well as a small part of the capitate the fifth metacarpal that is the little finger metacarpal articulates only with the hamate the four finger metacarpals also articulate proximally with each other through intermetacarpal ligaments distally 
each metacarpal head articulates with the base of its corresponding proximal phalanx. The attachments to the metacarpal bones are in the form of muscles, tendons and ligaments. First let us consider the muscle attachments, either the origin or the insertion. The opponent's pollicis muscle inserts into the ridge along the radial border of the thumb metacarpal. The transverse head of the adductor pollicis muscle arises from a ridge along the palmar surface of the shaft of the third metacarpal. The oblique head of the adductor pollicis arises from the basis of the index and middle finger metacarpals. The opponent's digiti minimi muscle inserts into the palmar surface of the fifth metacarpal along the ulnar border of the shaft. The palmar intrauchiae muscles arise from the radial side of the shaft of the little finger, the radial side of the shaft of the ring finger and the ulnar side of the shaft of the index finger. The dorsal intrauchiae arise from longitudinal grooves on the flexor surfaces of the metacarpal shafts and extend around to the dorsal surface. The tendons that attach to the metacarpals are as follows. The tendon of the flexor carpi radialis attaches to the tubercles at the bases of the index and middle fingers on the flexor aspect. The extensor carpi ulnaris tendon attaches to a tubercle at the base of the little finger metacarpal on the dorsal side. The extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon attaches to the styloid process of the middle metacarpal on the dorsal aspect and the extensor carpi radialis longest tendon attaches to the base of the index finger metacarpal. The abductor pollicis longus tendon attaches to the base of the thumb metacarpal on the dorsal aspect. The ligaments attached to the metacarpal bones are the carpometacarpal ligaments which reinforce the carpometacarpal joints and these are particularly strong over the index and middle finger carpometacarpal joints. The carpometacarpal joint of the thumb is reinforced by a ligament that passes from a tubercle on the trapezium to a dorsal prolongation on the base of the first metacarpal bone. The pisiform bone is also attached to the metacarpal bone by the pisohamate and the pisometacarpal ligaments which attach it to the hook of the hamate and to the base of the fifth metacarpal. The metacarpal heads are united by what is known as the deep transverse metacarpal ligament and finally the collateral ligaments for the metacarpophalangeal joints attach to the pits and the dorsal tubercles at the heads of the metacarpals. The blood supply to the metacarpal bones is through the three palmar metacarpal arteries which arise from the deep palmar arch. They also communicate with the common palmar digital arteries which are branches of the superficial arch and these arteries perforate the intraosseous spaces to anastomose with the dorsal metacarpal arteries. Ossification of the metacarpals is different in the thumb metacarpal and the finger metacarpals but they follow a particular pattern. The thumb metacarpal ossifies from two centers, one for the body and one for the base. The center for the body or the shaft appears by the eighth week of intrauterine life and the base appears at three years of age. The two unite at around 18 to 20 years of age. The finger metacarpals also ossify from two centers but here it is the body and the head. All the shafts appear by the 8th week of intrauterine life and the heads appear by 3 years of age and the two unite by 18 to 20 years. When we consider the functional anatomy of the metacarpals, we find that the shaft of the first metacarpal is set at a right angle to the plane of the other four metacarpals such as the axis of the thumb flexion and extension is across the palm. The shape of the metacarpal and the forces acting on the finger metacarpals are also important. You will note that the metacarpal is slightly concave forward. On the flexor side, the forces tend to compress and the, on the extensor side, the forces tend to extend or provide tension. So, when there is a fracture at this level, due to the forces on the flexor side, causing compression, the distal fragment of the fracture tilts to the volar side. 
and this is shown in the characteristic position of the fractured metacarpal shaft. The distal transverse arch of the palm is formed mainly by the metacarpals as we had already mentioned earlier. But this arch is maintained by the transverse metacarpal ligaments, the tone of the hypothenar muscles and capability of movement at the carpometacarpal joints of the ring and little fingers. Finally, the role of the collateral ligaments of the metacarpophalangeal joints are very important in maintaining function of the joint. These ligaments are attached on the metacarpal on what is known as the dorsal tubercle as we have already seen. On the proximal phalanx, they are attached to the joint capsule and the anterior surface of the base of the proximal phalanx. So, when the metacarpophalangeal joint is extended, these fibers are relaxed. When the metacarpophalangeal joint is flexed, these fibers are put on stretch and so the length of the fibers is maintained. Whereas in the extended position, because of the relaxed fibers, they can go in for fibrosis, leading to contracture of the metacarpophalangeal joints of the fingers in extended position. Having learnt the structural and functional anatomy, how does it affect the surgical aspects? The articulations of the base of the metacarpals with the carpal bones is very important. In fractures like this, where there is a disruption of the carpometacarpal joints with fractures, it is important to get back this alignment with the distal carpal row. If not, this is what will happen when there is total malalignment of the metacarpals with the carpal bones. In shaft fractures of the metacarpal, the features will depend on the integrity of the intrachiae muscle that are closely associated with the metacarpal. In fractures like this, where there is not much of involvement of the intrachiae, the edema will be less and there will be more of angulation of the metacarpal shaft fracture. Whereas, if there has been a severe injury to the intrachiae muscles, it leads to a lot of edema like this and because of the loss of integrity of the intrachiae muscles, there is a shortening of the metacarpal bones and overlap of the fractures. Positioning of the plate for fixation of shaft fractures also depends on understanding the anatomy and correct placement of the plates will ensure good results. Now we shall discuss the anatomy of the phalanges, mainly the proximal phalanx. The middle phalanx has got a similar anatomy to the proximal phalanx. The anatomy of the terminal phalanx is totally different and will be discussed in a separate video. Each proximal phalanx consists of three parts, the base, the body and the head. The base is the expanded proximal part of the proximal phalanx which is concave and has an oval shaped articular facet that articulates with the metacarpal head to form the metacarpophalangeal joint. The body of the proximal phalanx tapers distally and has two surfaces, the dorsal surface and the palmar surface. The dorsal surface is round and smooth, so it is convex in the transverse plane. The palmar surface is flat and rough, especially on the sides where the attachments of the fibrous flexor sheath are present. So it is flat in the transverse plane. The heads of the proximal phalanges have a pulley shaped articular surface which articulate with the base of the middle phalanx to form the proximal interphalangeal joint. The head has smooth grooves, especially on the palmar aspect. So when we consider the articulations of the proximal phalanges, proximally we have the metacarpophalangeal joint and distally the proximal interphalangeal joint. The attachments to the phalanges are mainly tendons and ligaments. The tendons that are attached to the phalanges are the flexor digitorum profundus which is inserted to the proximal part of the body of the terminal phalanx and the flexor digitorum superficialis which is inserted by two slips to either side of the middle phalanx. On the dorsal aspect, the intricate system of extensors is seen. To study about this intricate system, please click on the icon above. On the thumb, the extensor pollicis brevis tendon attaches to the dorsal aspect of the base of the proximal phalanx and the extensor pollicis longus tendon attaches to the dorsal aspect of the base of the distal phalanx. 
As far as the ligaments attached to the phalanges are concerned, there are mainly there are mainly four kinds. The first are the collateral ligaments of the metacarpophalangeal joints, which we have already seen. The palmar ligaments, or what are known as the volar plates, the fibrous flexor sheaths, that is, the annular pulleys A1, A3, and A5 arising from the volar plates and A2 and A4 arising from the periosteum on the proximal half of the proximal phalanx and the mid shaft of the middle phalanx respectively. The collateral ligaments of the interphalangeal joints are also important. They consist of a proper collateral ligament that runs from the head of the proximal phalanx to the base of the middle phalanx and the accessory collateral ligament that runs from the proximal phalanx bone to the joint capsule. The blood supply to the proximal phalanx is from the proper digital arteries and the neck of the proximal phalanx receives a blood supply from the interphalangeal arch that is formed between the proper digital arteries on the two sides. The ossification pattern of the phalanges is very characteristic. It ossifies from two centers, the body and the base. The ossification of the body starts from the 8th week of intrauterine life and the base starts from the 3rd year for the proximal phalanx and 4th year for the middle phalanx and terminal phalanx. The centers for the body and the base unite by 18 to 20 years of age. The function of the very important proximal interphalangeal joint depends on the congruity of the articular surfaces and any fracture of the head involving the articular surface must be treated perfectly. We also need to understand that there is a close proximity of the bone and hence any fractures to tendons both the flexors and the extensors. This diagram represents the cross section of the proximal phalanx bone with the dorsal convex side facing towards the upper part of the screen. The two digital flexor tendons are tightly packed in the fibrous flexor sheath on the volar aspect and the extensor tendons in the form of the extensor expansion appears as a thin sheet closely applied to the convex dorsal surface of the proximal phalanx. While managing a patient with a fracture of the proximal phalanx like this, we should be aware of this close association of the tendons and hence the possibility of formation of adhesions. In fracture management, if immobilization is required of the proximal interphalangeal joint, it must be placed in extended position. If it is placed in a flexed position, it leads to contracture of the volar plate, which if unattended may lead to a stiffness. I hope you enjoyed this video. I enjoyed making it. Please click on the shown links to see more videos put up in this channel. And do not forget to subscribe to stay connected with the latest in learning hand surgery. Vanakkam.